All right. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, again, my name is Andrew. I'm one of the uh, educators at the Jennifer Chomsky Planetarium at the Liberty Science Center. Um, and while we cannot be in the planetarium right now, I'm very excited to be here with you over Facebook Live to uh, talk with you about some of my favorite stories and discoveries that have happened uh, in, in the past several months in the fields of astronomy and space science. We're calling our program today Space News Now. Now, during the program, if you have any questions about the stories that we're talking about, uh, you can write your uh, questions into the comments on Facebook. Um, and I will try to answer them during the program, uh, but my colleague Mike will also be in the comments answering your questions as well. So we'll be talking today uh, uh, about, a, about a, a recent space launch, a new exoplanet discovery, a new black hole that we found. We got lots of really, really great stuff to talk about today. But before we do begin, a couple of quick uh, kind of housekeeping notes. Um, first of all, uh, Liberty Science Center is a nonprofit, and right now, more than ever, uh, we are relying on your support and support from our members and our donors to allow us to continue to do programming like this during the rest of the summer. So if you are able to and would like to support us, there is a donate button somewhere uh, near my head. I still haven't figured out where it is, if it's over here or over here, it's either to the left or to, or to the right of my head. I still don't know where. I should probably figure that out. But uh, but 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 that's the best way uh, for you to support us and our mission to keep on uh, do, uh, doing science education and uh, inspiring the next generation of scientists and engineers. Um, we're also going to be changing up uh, the dates of our trivia games. If you've been playing along with our trivia games, those. Uh, starting next week are going to be happening on Tuesdays. So Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, we will be doing trivia. And then Thursdays at 1 o'clock, we'll be continuing to do our uh, planetarium online sessions. Next week, we will be talking all about the deep solar systems, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and some of our other dwarf planets. I think that's all the housekeeping notes I have for us today. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and begin our program today by taking a look out at the sky as it would look actually on the 4th of July. So this is this is technically not a news story, but I guess more of a preview for something that will be happening uh, in just a couple of days. So on the 4th of July, there will be a really, really great sight that we will be able to see. We'll be able to see a full moon. Directly to the left of that full moon, we will be able to find the planets Jupiter and Saturn. It'd be a really great thing to check out uh, 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 as, as we might be outside safely celebrating the 4th of July. You may read in the news, though, between now and then, that there will be a lunar eclipse on this evening, which technically is true. But the eclipse we'll be seeing on the 4th of July will not be one that you can see with your eyes. The moon will still be completely safe to see, but the eclipse that will be happening is a kind of eclipse that your eyes can't see. It's called a penumbral eclipse. So what's going to be happening uh, and why can't we see it? Well, any eclipse of the moon happens for really just one main reason. That reason is that the Earth has a shadow. So the Earth has a shadow, just like any of us have a shadow. The sun shines on the Earth, and it is a shadow. But there are two main parts to the Earth's shadow. One part of the Earth's shadow is very, very dark. It's very, very dark. This, uh, this, this dark area right here. This is called the umbra. That's the main part of the Earth's shadow. There's another part of the Earth's shadow, though, we've drawn in red, that is called the penumbra. The penumbra really isn't much of a shadow at all. It, you can't really see it. Now, a total eclipse of the moon happens when the moon passes through the Earth's umbra, the dark part. What's going to happen, though, on the 4th of July is not the moon passing through the umbra, but passing through the penumbra. So that's why we call it a penumbral eclipse. And in fact, only about one third of the moon will be doing this. Just about the top third of the moon will be passing through the penumbra. 
the moon will technically get a little bit darker, but it's almost impossible to see with your eyes. But if you want to try to, to spot the moon getting a little bit darker, uh, you can step outside on the 4th of July, uh, right around 11.15 uh, or so in the evening, it will begin, and then it will end around 2 o'clock in the morning. So about a two-hour window, two-and-a-half-hour window, where you might be able to see the moon getting just a little bit fainter. So that's going to be happening. Uh, it's going to be happening again on the 4th of July, a penumbral lunar eclipse, something that will be uh, almost impossible to see with your eyes, but will still technically be happening. So it's always cool when something like this does happen. So if you want to wait for a total lunar eclipse, the next one visible from the United States will be on May 26th of 2021. So that will be the next total lunar eclipse that will be happening from the United States. Again, on May 26th, 2021. Uh, I guess we can mark, mark our calendars now for almost a year uh, into the future for that. Now, the next thing I wanted to share with you all is a news story that happened back on May 30th. And this news story is all about a human spaceflight launch. We're looking here at the launch pad, which is located in Florida. This is called Launch Complex 39A. It is the same launch complex where the Apollo 11 astronauts were launched way back in July of, uh, of 1969, who then became the first astronauts to walk on the moon. This launch, though, that happened on May 30th was really important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was the first time that American astronauts were actually launched from American soil since 2011. So it's, it's been nine years since Americans have been launched from American soil. But the other part that makes this story so exciting is the vehicle that these humans were launched on. It's the first time that humans have ever traveled into space on a spacecraft that was made by a private corporation, in this case, SpaceX. So this is the launch vehicle that was used to launch two astronauts up into space on May 30th. Now, most of what we're seeing here, most of the rocket from essentially this point where my mouse is on down is just really one big rocket engine. I guess a couple big rocket engines. Everything from here down is designed only to get the astronauts up into space. The astronauts themselves, though, were located right up here, just this little top piece. This is called the Dragon Capsule. That's where those astronauts were actually located. In this case, there were two astronauts who were launched. In the future, though, they'll be able to launch as many as four. Their names are Bob Benkin, over here on the left, uh, and Doug Hurley over here on the right. The, 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 these are two veteran astronauts. We can see picture here uh, in their spacesuits, uh, which look way more kind of sci-fi futuristic than, uh, than, than other spacesuits that astronauts have, uh, have worn in the past. So these two were launched from this launch pad here in Florida back on May 30th. So let's take a look at what the launch itself actually looked like. Because anytime we have a good excuse to show a rocket launch, uh, I always like to, to take that opportunity. This launch went off without a hitch. There were a couple of, of weather delays that happened a couple days before, but on the 30th, there were absolutely no weather problems at all. They were launched with their destination being the International Space Station. Now, the International Space Station is actually pretty close to us. It's only 250 miles away. If we drive in a car for 250 miles, we may not even go into a different state. But it is, of course, much harder to go 250 miles straight up fighting Earth's gravity. That's what we had to do. These two astronauts took a grand total of 19 hours from their launch to their actual docking with the International Space Station. To get there, they, they, they had to make a couple of orbits around the Earth to get moving at the correct velocity, at the right angle, to eventually dock. 
On their way, though, to the space station, the astronauts did give us a brief tour of their uh, of their Dragon Coast. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome aboard Endeavour, the uh, SpaceX vehicle headed to the International Space Station. Uh, today, we accomplished the first flight off the Florida coast in uh, quite some time, and Doug and I were really proud to have an opportunity to be a part of that. Uh, we're doing it in a brand new uh, spaceship, a spaceship that's a lot different than its namesake uh, Endeavour, the space shuttle, and that it has uh, touch display screens that allow us to accomplish most of the interfacing requirements that we have. We'll have a, a Doug pans over and points at the display in front of me. You can see the, the forward view that we had uh, uh, during the maneuvers that we most recently did. You can look out the window. It looks like the centerline camera doesn't have a lot of content on it now. We're kind of pointed into space so that the windows can see the Earth below us. But we've got the capability to interface with the vehicle, and it's kind of interesting. There's a command. This little button over here is actually what the commands are for our displays. One thing that does get lost is there is a uh, extensive uh, button panel down below as well. So over on uh, this side, we can, can turn the displays on and off as well as send some commands for some contingency situations. Uh, on the other side, we have the ability to uh, deploy shoots and things like that on entry. So uh, we do have some buttons, but the primary interface is uh, these displays. So nice, new, modern cockpit that we've got for our, our uh, compared to our namesake, the Space Shuttle uh, Endeavor. So, uh, so Bob and Doug mentioned in their tour of their Dragon capsule that it's a bit of a newer looking interface than what the old Space Shuttle Endeavour was like. This is a picture from inside the cockpit of that old Space Shuttle. Still a, uh, for, uh, for when it was around, a state-of-the-art uh, set of equipment, but not nearly as, uh, as futuristic looking uh, uh, and frankly not as easy to use as what, uh, uh, as what we just saw from Bob and Doug in the Dragon capsule. So a really exciting part about this launch was that it was done by a completely new group, by SpaceX. This was their first time launching humans. So they, they, they have a different set uh, of controls uh, that honestly look a little bit easier to use than uh, what we see here from, uh, 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 from the old uh, space shuttle. Their destination, though, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was the International Space Station, which, in my opinion, is um, one of the most incredible feats of engineering in the history of humanity. It is literally a floating space station that, to that orbits the Earth at about 250 miles away. There have been humans constantly on board the space station for almost 20 years now. Astronauts from 20 different nations have spent time here. And it's such an, an incredible technology that we have. The space station is honestly like a gigantic floating lab where astronauts help us learn more about how humans can handle being in space, um, how the human body and our muscles and our bones hold up to being in a zero gravity environment. Bob and Doug are going to be up there probably until early September. Um, before they eventually uh, safely travel back uh, back home to planet Earth. So uh, while they're there, they're conducting science experiments. Uh, uh, astronaut Bob uh, has gone so far on one spacewalk outside of the space station um, to, to do a little bit of maintenance and prep work for, uh, for, for any future uh, tasks that the astronauts are going to have up there. But while we're in this part of space orbiting around the Earth, I did want to take you to a telescope that lives in this, uh, in this same kind of orbit. And that would be probably my favorite telescope in the universe. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Hubble Telescope recently, back in April, celebrated its 30-year birthday. So the Hubble Telescope is actually older than I am. I'm only 26. Hubble has been one of the greatest tools that we've had to better understand astronomy and space and the universe around us. So to celebrate its 30th anniversary, I wanted to share with you my favorite picture that Hubble has ever taken. In fact, it's the same, uh, similar picture to the one you see uh, in this background behind my, uh, behind my, my uh, webcam feed. This picture is called the Hubble Deep Field. 
looks a little something like this. And at first glance, this almost looks like just a whole bunch of stars. But actually, every fuzzy little blob, every little dot of light you see here is actually a galaxy. In this one picture alone, we can see tens of thousands of galaxies just from one picture. This is from a very small piece of the sky, about the size of your pinky fingernail. This is not a very big part of space, and even just there, we see literally hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of galaxies. So happy 30th birthday to Hubble, and hopefully many, many more years. Um, so let me take a quick moment here um, and answer a couple questions that I am seeing. Uh, that I am seeing in the comments section here. So Amy wants to know how they got the space station into orbit. That's a really, really great question. Um, so all of the pieces of the space station were sent up into orbit separately. Once they were in space, they were, they, they were, they were pieced together. It was a really, really long process though to make it all happen. Um, yeah, it really is such an incredible feat of, of engineering that the space station is there and that it's been inhabited for tw almost 20 years now. Um, oh, and to answer another really important question that I saw earlier about lunar eclipses and whether or not they're safe to view. Every lunar eclipse is completely safe to view with your eyes. The type of eclipse you need to be careful with is a solar eclipse. But even those can be safe to view as long as you have the, uh, the, the, the correct type of, of protection for your eyes. But the lunar eclipse on the 4th, totally safe. Totally safe to view. Don't need any special glasses or any special protection at all. All right, so let's move on now to our next story. We're going to kind of move from one telescope, Hubble, onto another one, another telescope, which is named Kepler. So this here uh, is the Kepler Space Telescope, another telescope located in, in space. Kepler is unfortunately no longer active today, but it did live a long nine and a half year life where Kepler's goal was to search for exoplanets. An exoplanet is what we call a planet that orbits a star that is not the sun. And Kepler spent its nine, its over nine year life searching and studying literally hundreds of thousands of stars. It discovered on its own almost 3,000 planets. But to sort through all of that data, Kepler relies, and still relies today, on using computer algorithms and computer programs to kind of automate the process of looking through these images and this data to understand if we found a planet or not. Sometimes though, algorithms and computer programs can make mistakes. And the Kepler mission did label a number of data points, images, as false positives. These are data points that it thought originally could have been a planet, but it decided uh, uh, was actually something else causing it to look like a planet. But there is a group of scientists called the Kepler Planetary Rescue Committee, and their job is to look through the data that Kepler, the algorithms marked as false positives, and figure out for sure if there was actually a planet there or not. We can see the results of some of their work, some of their study here. This is the whole field of view of Kepler during its life. All of these red dots we're seeing are data points and images that the rescue committee looked at and decided, okay, there's definitely no planet here. But every now and again, they looked at data that was marked as a false positive, and they found these little green dots here that represent data points and images that maybe could have a planet in them after all. And earlier this year, they discovered one such planet, this little green dot here, which is a possible, and now we today have confirmed it to be a planet. It's a, it's a very special kind of exoplanet, though, and we're going to go ahead and take a closer 
look at it. The planet itself is a part of a solar system, just like the Earth is a part of a solar system. And the solar system is called Kepler-1649. We had already known about one planet in this solar system named Kepler-1649b, but the new one we discovered is named Kepler-1649c. That letter C just means it's the second planet that we discovered in the Kepler-1649 system. So, we found this brand new planet, but we find exoplanets all the time. We found over 4,000 of them. But this exoplanet is special for two reasons. One reason is that it is about the same size as our very own planet Earth. A little bit bigger, but close in size. It also lives within this star's habitable zone. So the habitable zone of a planet also sometimes called the Goldilocks zone, represented by this big green ring here. If you are a planet that lives inside of this habitable zone, that means you can be the right temperature, not too hot, not too cold, but just right, for you to have liquid water. And for a planet to have liquid water is really, really important. And this planet, Kepler-1649c, lives within this habitable zone. Now, it doesn't mean that this planet definitely has water around it. It means, though, that the potential is there for it to have water. It's going to require more follow-up studies for us to know for sure if there is actually water on this exoplanet. But finding them is really, really important. We've only found a few dozen planets that are like the Earth, or that are the size of the Earth, that could potentially have water on them. So every time we find a new one, it's a big deal. In the future, we'll study this system more and learn more about whether or not it could actually have water on it once and for all. So, always exciting to find a new exoplanet. Now, our next story is going to take us back into our uh, nighttime sky. We're going to look very quickly at a galaxy. Uh, and for those of you very eager to get to the black hole story, uh, I, I, I am saving the black hole story for last because um, it is my favorite of the stories we're going to be seeing today. So the black hole story will uh, will uh, will be coming last. Let's see. So, uh, so Victoria wants to know uh, uh, how I think the first woman will react to being in space. Um, in fact, there have been women in space already. Um, there have been dozens of women who have been in space so far. And they they've reacted to it incredibly well. They've they've uh, and we're going to be sending more women up into space in the future. Um, uh, it's a really really important thing to do. So lots of women have been in the space, and they and they have handled it absolutely perfectly. Um, so Victoria wants to know how far away is that exoplanet? Uh, it is a couple hundred light years away from the Earth, so it's pretty far away. For us to actually travel there would take us a few hundred thousand years, uh, actually more than that, uh, in a uh, spaceship like uh, like the ones that we have today. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, so on on to on to our next story. So uh, this is a this next story is kind of a kind of a, a cosmic mystery of sorts. It takes place inside of a galaxy beneath the constellation of Pegasus, the winged horse. The galaxy is called the Kinmen Dwarf Galaxy. It's called the Dwarf Galaxy because it's very, very small for a galaxy. Um, here is a picture of the Kinmen Dwarf Galaxy here in just a moment. This galaxy is about 75 million light years away and is very small, way, way smaller than our own Milky Way galaxy is. Because it's small and far away, it can be hard for us to take great pictures of it. This is a picture taken by the Hubble telescope. 
There is one star in this galaxy that astronomers love to study. Between, uh, uh, like, uh, earlier on uh, uh, in this century, um, between about 2001 and 2011, astronomers studied this galaxy very closely and looked at a very bright star called a luminous blue variable. Some of the brightest stars that exist in the universe. But then in 2019, a different group of scientists went to study this star again, but they couldn't find it. So we have a star that was two and a half million times brighter than the sun, and in an eight year window, completely disappeared. There is no trace, no sign of it existing anymore. We know it was there, but now it's just gone. So what happened? Stars don't just disappear into thin air. We can't find it anymore. This is a mystery that astronomers don't know the answer to. We do have two pretty good ideas, though, as to what could have happened to this very, very massive star. So, again, this was a kind of star called a luminous blue variable. These stars vary wildly in size. They shrink and expand and shrink and expand and shrink and expand over time. They're also very bright. Again, two and a half million times brighter than the sun. They're really, really bright stars. So one idea that could have caused this star to disappear to our eyes is that this star suddenly shrank. This could have happened for a couple of reasons. One reason would be that the inside of this star spontaneously heated up really quickly. Fusion in the center of the star accelerated very quickly. That threw out a huge pressure shock wave and that threw off the outer layers of this star. So this star could have lost a good 90% of its mass within a couple of years if a violent enough event happened inside of it. So one option is that this star lost 90% of its mass over the course of a few years. That means this star would now be too faint for us to see with our eyes, that's, or, or for us to see with a telescope. So that's one option for what happened to this mysterious disappearing star. The other option, and maybe an even more interesting option, is that this star collapsed into a black hole. Normally when this happens, normally when a star collapses into a black hole, it lets off a huge explosion as this happens. But we didn't see an explosion. So if this star formed a black hole, it would have just collapsed without a supernova, without an explosion, which is incredibly rare. We've only seen that happen maybe two or three times so far. The reason why we don't see anything now, if this is indeed what happened, <clears throat> excuse me, is because black holes don't emit any light. Black holes on their own are completely and totally invisible. So if this star did collapse into a black hole, we will never see it again. If what happened to the star was actually just its mass loss, there's a chance that it could come back later and flare up brighter again. But we don't know. We're going to keep on studying that galaxy, that Kinman Dwarf Galaxy, and hopefully figure out what happened to, uh, to this incredibly bright star. It used to be two and a half million times as bright as the sun. So it's pretty wild that it just went and disappeared. So we'll hopefully learn for sure what happened. Those right now, though, are our two best uh, hypotheses, our two best ideas as to what could have happened. Oh, so, uh, so I see a really, really great question. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Aliyah brings up um, what could have happened, or, or, or what if we just didn't look at it in time and we just missed the supernova? That's a really, really good question. Um, so when a supernova happens, we can still see them for 
centuries after they're done with. Um, it would have stayed bright enough that if it went supernova, we still would have been able to see it uh, several years later. So if there was a supernova, we would have seen it still. But that's a really, really great question. Um, and that, uh, uh, so yeah, that that's, so if it was supernova, we definitely would have seen that. So we can kind of rule that out. Uh, Jennifer, to answer your question, uh, that, that star was about 73 million light years away. It's in a whole nother galaxy. And we don't think there's any planets rotating around it. Um, uh, Avnita wants to know why, it, why was the star blue? That's a really, really good question. Let me actually bring that star back up for us one more time. So why was this star blue? This star was blue because it was really, really hot. The hottest stars glow blue. So that's why this one looks blue. Um, fainter stars will look more like an orange or a red color. This one looked blue, though, because it, it was really hot. Um, on the outside, tens of thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. On the inside, tens of millions of degrees Fahrenheit. So blue stars are just really, really hot. All right, so now we are going to move on to our final story of our show today and my personal favorite story that's happened in the past few months. If you've uh, attended any of our Facebook Live planetarium shows before, you will probably know that my favorite topic to discuss in astronomy are black holes. I love black holes. And recently, we found a new one which is always exciting news. So far, we're looking now at the Milky Way galaxy. These are the locations of all the black holes that we had discovered before. All of these purple dots are the locations of black holes that we had found in the Milky Way galaxy so far. Only a few dozen of them, not very many at all. To give you a sense of where the Earth is in all of this, the Earth is located right here. The Earth is not this big. I've made the Earth literally billions of times larger than it really is so we can see it. But this is where the Earth is located, very far away from any of these black holes. This story, though, is particularly exciting, not just because it's a new black hole that we found, because we found it in a way that we had never discovered a black hole before. Until this new discovery, all of the black holes in the Milky Way were discovered in the same way. They were discovered by watching the black hole eat other stars. You heard me correctly. By watching black holes eat other stars. Because black holes are completely dark and invisible on their own, we need something to be happening around them to be able to see them. And so far, the only way we had found them in our galaxy was by watching them develop this huge disk of gas around them. This is called an accretion disk. This accretion disk glows very brightly, allowing us to tell that there's a dark spot at the middle allowing us to know that there is a black hole here. But this was the only way that we could find black holes in the Milky Way. And we think these kinds of systems are very, very rare. We don't, we don't think they're very common at all. So astronomers are always trying to think of new ways to find black holes. And thankfully, we did it. We did it. We have now developed a new way to discover black holes. So, a black hole that we're going to see in just a moment that, is, that was newly discovered uh, is named HR6819-B8, dash black hole. It is also not only a new black hole, it's also the closest black hole that we've discovered so far to the Earth. It is a grand total of 1,000 light years away also known as six quadrillion miles. 
but this is the closest black hole to the Earth we've found so far, but it is still this many, six quadrillion miles away. Traveling in a spaceship, it would take you still 20 million years to get here. So even though it's the closest black hole to us, it's still very, very far away, certainly. So the black hole is a part of actually a larger star system named HR 6819. And astronomers had actually studied this star system for decades beforehand. When we looked at the star system, though, we only saw two stars, two stars in a binary pair. We observed them orbiting around each other, one star in the middle and one star around the outside. Now, these two stars we watched together for decades, and we thought they were the only two things in this system. But a team of astronomers studied this system very, very closely and looked at the orbit of this very, very innermost star. And they noticed that the orbit of this star was a little bit off, it's a little bit off. They knew, they discovered that there had to be another mass, another object here with gravity. The object would have to be about four times the mass of the sun to have this effect on the star. But no matter how hard they looked, they didn't see a star there. But they still knew that there was a mass there of four times the mass of the sun. So they concluded the only object in the universe that could be four times the mass of the sun but also look completely invisible is a black hole. So we now know that orbiting at the inner part of this triple star system is another black hole. We know that there's a black hole here. So two stars and a black hole. This is the first confirmed discovery of a black hole in this way. We think there could be many other situations just like this one where there could be a black hole as a part of kind of a triple star system. So this is my favorite story that's happened in the past few months. Um, anytime we find a new black hole is cause for celebration because we haven't found that many of them. So far, we've only found about three or four dozen of them uh, uh, in, in our Milky Way galaxy. So those are some of my favorite space stories that have happened so far in the past months, which does bring us to the end of our program today. I do want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'll be hanging out for another few minutes to answer more questions that, that you have. So if you've got questions, you can write them uh, into the comments now, and I'll do my best to answer as many of them as I can. If you, though, would like to support Liberty Science Center, we are a nonprofit, and now more than ever, we, we rely on your donations to help support us through, uh, through this summer. You can support us if you're able to and if you would like to by using the, the donate button somewhere near my head, either to the left of me or to the right of me. Somewhere, one of these two directions, you'll find a button that says donate, and that's the best way to uh, donate and support Liberty Science Center and our mission to continue to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers and astronomers and everyone who's going to help us learn more about black holes uh, in the future. We'll be doing another one of our Planetarium online programs next Thursday at 1. Uh, our Planetarium director, Mike, will be here talking with us about the deep solar system. So Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, the rest of the dwarf planets, and whatever else is out there in the very, very outer reaches of the solar system. But I do want to thank you all for joining us once again today. I'm going to hang out now for at least five minutes to answer more questions that you might have about uh, uh, about any of our space stories that we covered today.
Let's see. So, uh, Saritha wants to know what planet is similar to the Earth. So the new planet that we discovered that we hope is similar to the Earth, we don't know for sure yet if it is, it's got the potential to be, is a planet named Kepler 1649c. So Kepler 1649c is the name of the newly discovered planet that could be like the Earth. Again, we don't know for sure quite yet, but it could be. Let's see. Ah, so Mike wants to know that why in this presentation did I use miles and not kilometers and Fahrenheit instead of Kelvin? That's a really, really great question. It's something that honestly I struggle with all the time. Um, NASA and most scientists use uh, kilometers and they use Kelvin to measure, uh, to measure uh, temperature. But most of us in the United States, we understand miles and Fahrenheit a bit better than we understand kilometers and, um, and, uh, and Kelvin. So uh, I make the choice to use miles because, uh, uh, in my opinion, it, it makes the numbers a bit more approachable. Because it's a number and a unit that, uh, that I hope our guests and our, and our audience uh, are a bit more familiar with. To kind of... And then remove one step from the uh, uh, from the difficulty of communicating science. Uh, so, uh, uh, Brock's daughter has a question: uh, How are black holes formed? That is such a good question, and thank you for asking it. Black holes are formed when really, 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 really big stars run out of fuel. So, stars that are like twenty times as big as our sun. When they run out of fuel, they collapse, and then they form black holes. So they form from really, really big stars. Um, so AJ wants to know what is going to happen with the two stars that are in the system with the black hole. It's a good question. As far as we know, they're going to continue in their, in their orbits together with that black hole for a very, 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 very long time. Near, as far as we can tell, it's still a very stable system. The stars aren't close enough to that black hole um, to have the black hole really uh, eat them, like we saw earlier. So those two stars, we think, will be totally fine in their orbit and in their travels near that black hole. Uh, so, uh, uh, Aliyah wants to know, when will the next Planetarium Online be? That will be next Thursday at 1 o'clock. So the same time that this one started. So Thursday at 1 o'clock Eastern Time will be the next Planetarium Online. And every Thursday at 1 o'clock during the summer, we'll be having a brand new Planetarium Online. There a chance for our planet or the solar system to be swallowed by a black hole. Now I never want to say there's a zero percent chance because there's technically a chance, but in this case I'm going to say there is a zero percent chance that the Earth or the solar system will ever be swallowed by a black hole. There are no black holes anywhere near us in space close enough to ever affect us. So the Earth and the solar system will never ever be sucked into it. There's just not any black holes near us. And the sun also will never turn into a black hole. The sun's not big enough to do that. Uh, let's see. Amutha wants to know what kind of energy do stars use? That's a really, really good question. So stars are powered by something called nuclear fusion. Most stars during their lives are powered by the fusion of hydrogen into helium. So it's a long process that only happens in the cores of stars. They need to be really, really hot. It's happened where two hydrogen Essentially, two protons, two molecules of hydrogen, will 
essentially fuse together. Through another few reactions, they, they will eventually fuse together into helium. In every one of these combinations and these fusions, a little bit, well, I guess a lot of energy is, is released as these, as these kind of transformations, as these fusion steps happen. So that's what powers a star. Stars use nuclear fusion to power themselves. Uh, not technology we have here on the Earth quite yet, though I know there are a lot of scientists trying right now as we speak um, to, uh, to develop nuclear fusion for, uh, for humans on the Earth. It'd be pretty cool. Hmm. So, uh, Punam asked a really good question. What was the first planet found or discovered? And there's a few different ways to answer that question. Pretty much for all of human history, humans knew about the Earth, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those are planets that are big enough to be seen with your eyes. And uh, even a few thousand years ago, we knew that they were planets. The first planet to ever be discovered would be the planet Uranus. That was discovered back in the 1800s with a telescope. The first planets outside of our solar system to be discovered, though, um, was a planet that was uh, observed around a around a kind of neutron star and unfortunately i forget the name of that planet right now off the top of my head let me think about it see if i can remember it but, but the first planet outside of the solar system that we found was found around a neutron star the first planet that we found that orbited a star like the sun was named 51 pegasi b the first exoplanet we found orbiting a star that was like. All right. So let me answer one more question before we run out of time. One more question. So what happens if two black holes collide or come in contact with each other. Hmm. Well, when that happens, when two black holes collide, they actually form one larger black hole. In that collision, though, they release a ton of energy in a kind of explosion that we can't see with our eyes. But the explosion releases energy that is more energy than is created in the entire universe for just a split second of time. So when two black holes collide, they explode and form into one larger black hole. Now, I bet I can guess what some of you are thinking right now. What happens when three black holes or four or five, or what if two gigantic black holes come smashing together? Well, no matter how big black holes are, or how many of them there are, whenever black holes combine together, there is an explosion and one larger black hole, at least one black hole that was larger than either of the two that went into making. So whenever black holes collide, they just make a bigger black hole. It's a, it's a thankfully a very simple, a simple question for, uh, for me to answer. Um, but yeah, once again, I do want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, you've asked some wonderful questions. Uh, my favorite part about doing these shows is answering all, all at least as many of your questions uh, as we can during these 45 minutes. Um, but I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day and also a very, very safe weekend and a wonderful summer. Uh, if you're looking for more science to do uh, over the summer, you can check out our, our website, lsc.org, and check out LSC in the House. You will find recordings of our previous planetarium programs as well as some of our great live from programs and our animal updates there as well. Also, some great hands-on experiments to uh, keep you busy during, uh, during our, our, our long 4th of July holiday weekend. 
If you'd like to support us uh, and you're able to, you can do that using the donate button here next to my head somewhere, um, either to the left or to the right. Uh, that's the best way to support us financially to allow us to continue to do these programs during the rest of the summer. But thank you all once again. I hope to see you back here next Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m. for our next Planetarium Online program. Thanks, everyone, once again, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day.